Hi everybody um, and welcome to my presentation. Um, the title of my paper is Beauty and its Discontent, Gender, Class and Aesthetic Labour in Calcutta and my name is Henrike and I'm um, at Goldsmith. Um, so um, this is um, pretty much um, work in progress um, and I cut out all the ethnography that, um, that would be kind of taking up too much time but the paper is um, actually drawing on ethnography with aspiring beauty workers and their middle-class customers as well as their teachers in Calcutta, India and the main sites of fieldwork um, were an NGO in the south of the city which provides a range of courses addressing girls and inverted commas educational underachievement um, and offer um, skills-based training for young women who drop out of school from the nearby informal settlements. Um, the second main set of data stems from interviews with middle-class customers in beauty salons and at home, and also participant observation in interaction, of interactions and um, beauticians' work in different kinds of salons. Um, First of all, to frame this, um, I'm drawing on um, a lot of literature on neoliberal um, femininities um, and gendered um, notions of empowerment, which are very much part of uh, government discourses in India, um, where the focus is not only very much on education and training, but also on employment, and uh, where women, and particularly young girls, are um, featuring as um, targets for all sorts of interventions. Over the last two decades, while India has experienced the full impact of liberalization policies, the empowerment of women and their incorporation into the global work of paid employment and consumer identities has been celebrated um, by the Indian government and the many other agents of such changes, including um, development organizations and NGOs. Indian women are central to the narrative of a new and globalizing India, one which offers opportunities to those formerly excluded and whose citizens are actively embracing um, opportunities offered by market economies, regardless of gender, ethnicity, caste um, and religious affiliation. In this narrative, young women play a particularly prominent role as they are no longer just recipients of charity in inverted commas, subjects of reform projects or cast as symbols of essentialist traditional values. They are, as a cursory glance at Indian media representations suggests, the true beneficiaries of liberalization and promoters of agentive neoliberal selfhood, aspirational, successful and empowered, most obviously through participation in the world of work and the way this enables global affluent lifestyles. This discourse links gendered, class and racialized subjectivities which structure the field of beauty work in relation to wider caring responsibilities and gendered roles that are framed by consumer citizenship. And moving on. However, such notions are changing with the massive growth of the beauty industry. And for young women from poor households with few qualifications and no chance to go on to higher education, training in female and women-centered jobs is promoted as a way into the labor market and often understood as the main alternative to joining their mothers as domestic workers. Locally, as well as in official government and NGO discourses, young girls are seen as a resource for the family, the community and the nation, and thus need to be empowered to fulfill their potential. And in different conversations, the objective of, inverted commas, doing salon work was cast by um, the young women I worked with also their teachers at the center as enabling, uh, enabling care for the community and the family by contributing an income, preventing early pregnancy by keeping young women's aspirations high and as a way to realize neoliberal ideas of individualism and agentive selves. Many of the young women had a vague desire to join a team working in one of the neighborhood parlors, but none had visited one or knew someone who had landed such a job. So the paper um, draws on local ideas about beauty work on interviews with um, those middle-class customers of salons who express their ideas about the workers there, but also about what that work entails and the quality um, of such interactions. Um, the importance of the teachers who are um, transferring the skills and are basically representatives of the kind of um, empowerment discourse vis-a-vis um, -vis those, those young women. Um, and of course, um, the ideas that these young um, um, 
subjects have themselves of what this actually might mean in their lives, right? And it is very clear from, from kind of combi combining all these different sources of information that um, the, um, there is not an easy translation of what is often understood as problematic, polluting, low cost, and morally prob problematic work locally as um, a kind of empowering way of forging um, a career and a different kind of service. Um, for the trainees, that is for the young women themselves, the training that they received at the center, which was um, of course very classed, and we can talk about that in the discussion, I hope, the training was embedded into a much broader web of social relations, desires and practicalities. Much of the talk was related to the way beauty work would allow for access to middle class ideals of professionalism. Um, the looks and the way that you can kind of create a particular representation of yourself was very much related to the idea of the middle class um, earning um, professional. Um, but it also allowed work undertaken in the community and would fit in with having children and domestic roles. And the kind of, um, the, the prime example for that was always doing bridal makeup. Bridal makeup was something that was considered to be um, very constitutive of care work in the community and of also of enabling interdependence and um, recipro reciprocity um, that would allow young women to um, actually have time off or um, engage with um, relatives and um, neighbors in a constructive manner that made them feel very good about themselves. Those taking the course argued that work with beautiful materials, and again, this material aspect was very important, right? Being entrusted with um, um, very expensive, in, in their world, very expensive um, materials was quite an important part of that. Um, um, so working with beautiful materials, expensive products, and being with friends drew them to the center. And for some who were already mothers at age 18, it was a way to gain some autonomy from the expectations of the community and their families. In many ways, it became clear that those who needed an income most, namely those who um, um, had children um, and were no longer in education, um, in order to free some time and space for themselves, were those least equipped to do so. Um, and in, in a way, you know, this is a kind of, you know, vicious circle that is repeated um, across those different kinds of sites again and again and again. Um, what really um, um, linked the ideas that the teachers had, the ideas that um, the young women had, was the notion of um, agentive subjects, of those who are um, actually actively um, engaging with aspirations to middle class lifestyles and that who therefore were able to make choices, different kinds of choices, across their um, training and with that training, what, what what they would do with that training. A lot of them, for a lot of the, uh, the young trainees, it was absolutely crucial to differentiate themselves from um, the lives of their mothers who were domestic workers and to kind of elevate their own um, aspirations um, and the idea of beauty work um, as something that was clean, that was um, not as hard and that um, had a, a high status within the community. Um, they were also very much aware of class difference in the role of beauty work, but they were not necessarily um, very clear about what their middle class customers would think of them. They knew um, that um, beauty uh, work was very much valued in terms of, you know, the um, economic benefits of engaging with it, but they did not necessarily um, understand that um, they would not be able to forge a career out of it in the sense of kind of joining a salon and then becoming one of the main um, proprietors of a, a similar establishment. That was very much one of the um, imaginary futures that came with training as a beautician. Um, they, as I said, embraced the professionalism of beauty work and they also constructed these agenda selves through um, the actual materiality of the process of training, um, the skills that they acquired, but much more the connections that they made with others in the same situation and um, those who would be their imaginary customers later on. Um, so where does this leave us? First of all, um, it kind of points towards the gendered entanglements of this kind of care work and the multiple facets of um, of care that emerge here um, and the, the work that this kind of um, 
aesthetic labor does um, within the um, imaginary um, futures of those young women, but also in reality in terms of um, the way that it is framed by interclass relationships and uh, pans out very differently for middle class subjects or for those um, from less affluent backgrounds. Clearly, the subjects um, in reality had no intention to work in a salon, right? Um, and there was none of them over the two years that I followed those courses. Um, there was none of them who ever actually get, got a job in, in one of the many, many neighborhood um, um, beauty parlors. But what they were gaining from it was that they were partaking in aspirational kinds of self-representation um, and, as I said, imaginary futures. Um, the, the, they were very re much related to um, consumer identities, right? Um, learning how to do bridal makeup and um, to use expensive products was not, as, um, for instance, Paul Willis' work suggests, a matter of finding a place in the existing gender class matrix by learning how to work. Nor was it a matter, as Mahmoud suggests, uh, for her Muslim subjects, an engagement with alternative femininities by, for instance, adopting a positive discourse around um, respectable techniques of the self. Um, writing on entrepreneurial selves, um, Angela McRobbie has argued images of female empowerment today bring together employment, freedom and consumerism as part of self-creation. What the paper suggests is that when it comes to care work and specifically when it comes to body work, that the, um, the possibilities are um, relatively limited and right across the range of recent studies of young women's self-identity, it is apparent that occupational status has become, on the one hand, an overriding factor in the presentation of self, but at the same time, very few studies take, um, take the entanglements, the community, the kin work, the um, networking that these kind of um, labors in, in, in allow um, seriously. For the non-Western world, for want of a better descriptor, Hickel and others have argued the girl effect, the idea that young women constitute perfect targets for development intervention, has had similar effects. If girls are enabled to enter the labor market, then their autonomy within patriarchal traditional frameworks is enhanced and they are empowered. Um, what that um, suggests in the current context is that if we look at beauty work as body work, then we have to take into account not only local notions of what body work actually represents, um, not only who does it, but also um, what um, kind of aspirations are nurtured here. And um, the um, importance of the workism, the, the notion that work per se is going to be empowering within the context of those kind of jobs. Um, and what they enable. So um, what I'm trying to suggest here um, is that care work, if it is beauty work, is embedded in wider contexts of care work that are very much gendered and also classed. And I think it's worth exploring those entanglements in much more detail. Thank you. Sista, how are you, darling? Darling. Mara is a term that we use instead of Marika. You'll be sitting outside under a tree and then you'll hear Mara and you turn around. Hello, you know that you're being spotted. Despite the beauty salon sector includes a variety of workers such as hairdressers, stylists, image consultants, barbers, and manicurists. In this presentation, I will place emphasis particularly on the experiences of Maras or trans hairdressers in the archipelago of San Andres, Providencia and Santa Catalina in the West Caribbean. All of them have been engaged in the beauty and care professions, beauty pageants, her dressings, and sex work. Firstly, call Henrietta and Old Providence Islands, and joined in 1822 to the Republic of La Gran Colombia, the region has been populated by the Raizal ethnic group since British colonizers settled on Providencia to form a Puritan colony on 1629 during the long course of the transatlantic slave trade. The Raizales identified themselves differently from the descendants of migrants from mainland Colombia, usually known as Pañas, and from Arabs of Syrian and Lebanese origin, who are habitually called Turks, massively arrived in the second half of the 20th century. Caring for appearance is one of the tasks that trans women have typically performed throughout their social professional trajectories. This responds to the social imagination of the Carintillo, which is based on the myth that las maricas have the best hand for cutting and straightening hair. 
Paradoxically, as Mariluz told me, many clients didn't return because the religions here, there are some religions here where they say that we transmit something with our hands, that we transmit sin, the devil and evil things. I reversed the logic of these prejudices and stereotypes about the bodies of trans hairstylists, and I approached them as sociological research questions. So the common sense phrases are, why trans women are so into aesthetic issues? Why always sex workers and hairdressers? So under the umbrella term trans, as a continuum and universe of stylistic possibilities, and as a stigmatized, excluded, historically pathologized and criminalized social category, this analysis raises the importance of recognizing their hairdressing or beauty salon as a fundamental sector in the generation of employment for us as trans women, as well as a space or a career of transit in which ethno-racial identities, genders and sexuality are negotiated and experienced. Her dressing salon also emerges as a space where particular processes of individuation are produced and or conveyed. Beauty salons are also for trans women an epicenter of sociability and intercultural relations that facilitate the affirmation of respectability and self-esteem to overcome social content, racism, and discrimination. As pointed out by feminists such as Bell Hooks in the United States, Neil McGomez in Brazil, and Luz Gabriela Arango in Colombia. This presentation pays homage to the Arango's pioneering work in the country since 2011. Luz Gabriela passed away in October 2017 in the process of editing a hairdresser's book, launched a year later. From this research, my approaches became a sort of transethnography, as suggested by Colombian trans anthropologist Andrea Garcia, or an intersectional ethnography in her salons, as proposed by Milian Kang regarding Korean nails workers in New York. In the case of the work carried out by her dressers, their community work has helped not only to overcome the stigma against trans women, but also to change perceptions on the insular social bond and to attenuate the confrontation between Pañas and Rizales, who are part of their clientele. Peter Wilson's classic ethnography, Son Providencia, from Antics, a Caribbean case study of the conflict between reputation and respectability, highlighted that respectability is a value promulgated by the English inspired Baptist Church and the main criterion of social differentiation of insular societies. Generally speaking, respectability at the time brought together a set of values promoted by Puritans and Calvinists, which included the acquisition of a stable income, the search for whiteness of the skin color, the guarantee of order in the family and closeness to God. In this way, if since the abolition of slavery in 1853 in the islands, the islanders believe in the principle of communal equality, the individuals should in any case respond to the values promulgated by the high class, ensuring its political domination. Reputation is stipulated the minimum requirements of adult manhood and respect for the dignity of the individual and homosexual or maricas as they are called are among the most despised of men even though homosexual activities are widely indulged in it. Giuseppe Campuzano from the Travesti Museum of Peru regarding the Indian Catholic model highlighted that in Ordenanzas de los Indios in 1556 by Gregorio Gonzalez de Cuenca, criminalization was promoted based on Deuteronomy and Corinthians in the Bible. If any Indian male dresses in female Indian clothes or any Indian female in male Indian clothes, the major should arrest them. These ideas were taken up during the so-called Colombianization of the islands at the beginning of the 20th century. It was about the sending of Catholic and Spanish speaking Capuchin missions to whom the education and conversion to the Catholic faith of the peripheral ter territories of the Colombian nation would have been entrusted. Although in the 80s, the crime of acceso carnal homosexual and the criminalization of homoerotic sexual relations between consenting adults disappear, dressing in clothes considered those of the opposite sex was still punishable in the country. According to Yusmedia Solano, Peter Wilson cannot infer the decisive contributions of women to this Caribbean society or discern the mechanisms of their subordination. A dichotomy and opposition of the feminine and masculine are perceived in Providencia and Santa Catalina, as well as the hegemonic model of sexual desire throughout the relationships of the heterosexual couples. Nevertheless, single islander women develop an autonomy in a society that has traditionally considered women's duty to care for and live under the responsibility of others and has made it necessary to live as heterosexual couples. Although the origin of the term has not been elucidated, the use of the expression maras 
in the Colombian Caribbean, it's close to the Creole term maconme or macumé in Martinica, which has its equivalent masisi in Haitian Creole in the West Indies. As a product of this social bond of colonial history, the Maras face one of the great social challenges to affirm their existence and protect themselves. Las Maras are still resistant and through a globalization in a continuum of identification possibilities and creatively to social sanctions. As Joseph Gaskins from Bahamas pointed out, the differences complicate reductive narratives of a Pancaravian homophobia and in each case present particular challenges in areas of resistance. In recent years, the participation of travestis, continental Afro-Caribbean and Afro-Raizales has been promoted particularly by the return of beauty contests in 2013, which originated in the 80s as a spaces for sociability and strategies for community visibility. In these situated experiences, beauty pageants are not created to be seen by men, but to assert an identity within the community and to demand respect for their dignity. The ways in which Maras assert their pride regarding white beauty opens, opens an area of anti-racist resistance that at the same time questions heteronormativity. The Maras have found social support in, the, in their professional activities that bring them together with older people whose gender and sexual identities have been historically been discriminated against. Trans women's beauty salons since their emergence in the 80s have become an employment alternative for many of them, not only in the region, but also in mainland Colombia. Trans women have been working in beauty salons, which are not only spaces where femininity is displayed and where, and dis displayed and where professional projects take place, but also place, places where it is possible to politically mobilize the recognition of their gender identities, both in institutional and community spheres. In the case of the archipelago, Mundo Diverso Association, constituted with the, uh, within one of them in 2013, was created with the objective of defending the rights of LGBTI population. In 2016, the national government adopted the national public policy as a result of a work initiated in 2010 with the participation of civil society, and it was finally detected in 2018. The Maras have tried to overcome the social challenges that characterizes their life trajectories, which has been widely shown in ethnographies and in documentaries, such as the dialectic, the dichotomy, or the ghost of the puta peluquera, because they have all work both. As Risa told me about sex work, well, the one who said that she has never done it, it's totally a liar, regardless of you, my friend, because I don't know. Sex work and hairdressers are sectors where the construction of the trans body, the arrival of trans women after the loss of support, the learning of skills and professional insertion, the creation of sociability between Maras and the Islanders client, uh, the Islander clientele converge. Both spaces enable trans women to resolve their economic support and continue their transitions. After an accumulation of discrimination, it is possible to build trans feminine, a trans feminine identity in the face of a fairly small professional market that is extremely feminized and racialized. Stylists try to maintain a distance from clients to avoid doubts about the service offered. In addition, it's not typically that beauty salons where trans women work are in the middle of high class sectors. Both her dressers, residences and establishments are located are in working class uh, neighborhoods. And the few matters have to navigate in the middle of the vastness of the sector. The pigmentocracy of the horror hairdresser dichotomy manifests itself as a product of the social imaginary that viralizes the bodies of black trans women and brown uh, trans women. In such sense, the sexualization of race and the racialization of sexual moves in the sexual uh, market between the fantasies of a so-called gift the woman with potent penis and the erotization of, and the exotism of the ghost of the brilliant black man. The Maras played trans antics to gradually cope with the social challenges that allowed them to maneuver on the archipelago. Peter Wilson describes the form of organization of the insular Caribbean through the metaphor of the craft antics. Crab antics is behavior that resembles that of a number of crabs who, having been placed in a barrel, all try to climb out. But as one nears the top, 
the one below pulls him down in his own effort to climb. Only a particularly strong crab ever climbs out. The rest, in the long run, remain in the same place. What turns to be irrelevant, what turns, what turns out to be irrelevant in his ethnography, I call the jellyfish antics. I can cross to the metaphor of the jellyfish from Azul, who was a leader representing lesbians on the Human Rights Committee of the LGBTI policy. Azul told me that they didn't want to self-define in any identity category or that sexuality and gender go beyond a matter of identity. Azul took me to beauty salons telling me if I had seen the jellyfish in the sea, if I had seen the hair of the jellyfish, what seemed important to me was to realize that precisely trans stylists could be described in this way in a sector in which lesbians and trans, mare, trans men are not exactly the workers. It is not in this case about the snake hairs of the jellyfish that staged the image of castration in Greek mythology used by Freud in his classic essay in psychoanalysis, Medusa's Head. Rather, Azul's personification refers to the jellyfish in the sea in a positive sense as a part of the light of the island ecosystem that all the stylists defend as their habitat. This reference to the animal doesn't hierarchize between what trans women do with her beauty and their lives and what the island territory in which they live means to them. On the contrary, it revitalizes their life trajectories in a way that is the opposite of the demonic bestialization with, uh, with which the Mara have been usually being conceived. The Maras assert their singularity in the insular social bond through a decade of appearance and the clientele who seek them out because they have the power of beautify. These are their antics. Beyond Wilson's model of reputation and respectability, whose principles have been eroded, the jellyfish antics refer to a way of creating personal lifestyles in an insular social bond that has been transformed, making possible changes in the ways of living sexuality and gender identities. It means a way for trans women to assert themselves as individuals by making recurs to beauty within their communities to maneuver and get on. As the absence absence of gender in creole third person pronouns, obscured by the rules of no sense, as Omisiki Natasha Tinsley describes, because the social challenge is to be like the ocean, spreading a word, running through our base and fingers while remaining heavy, stinging a, a force against our hands. Or as the Chilean local writer Pedro Lemebel pointed out in Las Tarantulas en el Pelo, Las manos tarántulas de las locas tejen la cara pública de la estructura que las reprime, traicionando el gesto puritano con el rictus burlesco que parpadea nostálgico en el caleidoscopio de los espejos. In the islands, it echoes a Nancy spider trickster of the African Caribbean folktale. Miss Nancy, or Brida Nancy, or Sista Nancy, is the Creole character that reigns almost undefeated in children's literature. It is a reference to the protagonist of the antics that remains in the oral tradition of the African diaspora. Or to resort to this representation as the Raizal writer Rubian Pan Somerson does in a process of preservation of the Creole language in her poem, Fidi Joruba Pong Kien and another Afro Creole son Teen in a few eat food. To talk about the sea, about jellyfish, maras, locas, or trans, as Wilson did with the crabs. It's a way to show once again that identity is not fixed. I ego, it's not always linked to a single category, sex or gender, and the personal life of the Maras also has other reference that creatively emerge in their careers as stylists of beauty. As the jellyfish, any trans mind when a man asks them who you are, thou you, because in the insular relational aesthetics, after all, they exist just as the crab, the crab or the snail, the cons exist. Thank you. Good day. I'm Marianne Santos and this is my presentation. Pakiki Pagapa, the Filipino value of care as driving force throughout the Filipino migrant journey. Out of an estimate 108.7 million Filipinos, more than 10% live and work overseas. The total remittances sent by Filipinos in 2019 amounted to 63.5 billion US dollars. That's 14.7% of the Philippines' gross national income. In 2018, of the Philippines' population, 
um, 16.6% lived below the national poverty line. Remittances have helped the Philippine economy stay afloat amid various financial crises. Even without the pandemic, this puts the country and its people in a situation of precarity. Philippine society is familial and social. It has and continues to focus not on the individual alone, but on relationships between individuals. Psikolohiyang Filipino or Filipino psychology is an indigenous practice that started in the 1970s, rooted in Philippine culture and traditions. Its forerunner, Virgilio Enriquez, identified kapwa or shared identity as the core Filipino indigenous concept and pakikipagkapwa as the way that Filipinos relate to the world, so that I is not separate from the other but is seen in relation to the other. With this communitarian worldview, Filipinos grew up thinking of others, starting with members of close and extended family, as well as themselves. I assert that this core of care permeates the, the migrant journey, the entire migrant journey in three ways. Number one, as motivating migration. Number two, as maintaining the bond between members of transnational families. Number three, as laying the foundation for the future. I conducted research in May 2019 among members of the Filipino community in Valencia, Spain, while pursuing my master's in women's and gender studies at the University of Granada. The Filipinos who participate, participated in the study all attended Mass in English at a church in Valencia held every Sunday, presided over by a Filipino priest. Before the pandemic, Filipinos in and around Valencia gathered for potluck lunch after Mass every first Sunday of the month sharing food and stories with each other. This was the setting where I met them. Our conversations were largely in Filipino with some English and Spanish words following methodologies prescribed by Psikolohiyang Pilipino. The interviews were in the form of pakikipagwentuhan and pagtatanong-tanong. In addition, so that they would feel at ease with me, I lived in Valencia for a few days each week, including weekends, when many of the participants had time to meet with me. During our conversations, they shared with me their life stories and I actively listened, then played back the recordings for transcription and translated their emotional narratives to English to help with my analysis. Following are some data about the research participants. Aida, 72, is a single mother with one daughter. She is the eldest of five siblings. In the Philippines, she had worked as a school teacher. But in Spain, she worked first as a care worker for a few families and a waitress in a restaurant before she obtained a convalidación that permitted her to officially work as a teacher. She retired after 40 years of working and now helps care for her grandchildren. Baby 69 is a single mother with one son. She's the youngest among 11 children. She left her baby in her mother's care and arrived in Spain in 1980. She was a care worker for several families, then a cook in a restaurant before retiring after more than 30 years. She has lived with her partner for more than 20 years. Kathy, 73, is single. She is third among 10 children. In the Philippines, she was a clerk in a hospital for eight years. She arrived in Spain in 1985, where for one family, she worked for 17 years. Now, though retired, she sometimes takes care of her farmer wards grandmother or son. <clears throat> Dora, 62, is in a domestic partnership. She is the fifth among eight children. She came to Spain after college graduation and was a care worker for one family for 20 years until a herniated disc forced her to stop working for one year. She now works as a part-time carer for an old Spanish woman with Alzheimer's disease. All of them have resided in Spain for more than 10 years, are Spanish citizens, and are approaching or are already retired. They were all born and raised in the Philippines, had college-level education, and had experience in care work in Spain. Pakikipagkapwa motivates Filipinos to leave their homes in the Global South to earn more money in the Global North and send them back in what Katigbak calls emotional remittances. Aida and Kathy, who were both professionals, wrestled with thoughts of being poor in the Philippines but never having to work in servitude. Yet they had to resolve the sense of imbalance that relegated them to the domestic space in Spain. 
Parena cites contradictory class mobility as one reason for the rupture in self-identity that comes with being restricted from working in the public sphere as they had done in the Philippines and instead working in the private sphere, making the sacrifice in the name of upward financial mobility. Baby, whose first real job was as a care worker in Spain, says, whenever I missed my family, I would think of how much money I would be able to send them and then I would go back to work. <clears throat> Motivated by Pakikipagkapa, despite the homesickness and the alienation, they focus on working for the welfare of their families back home. In many cases, as Aida and Baby narrate, they would save very little of their monthly wages and send about 90% to their families. Consequently, they were unable to build their savings for going luxuries, including flights home. The money they sent for their parents, siblings, and children is not valued simply in terms of purchasing power. As Mackay says, it bears their love. Despite their physical absence, their remittances show they care. Mothers usually bind Filipino families together. They are called ilaw ng tahanan or the light of the home. For my research participants, their mother's deaths were pivotal crisis events. Baby finally went back for the first time after six years upon her mother's death for the funeral and to transfer care of her son to her sister. Kathy made it home just in time for her mother's fun funeral. Baldassar cites the need of migrants to be physically present in order to go through the process of grieving in aid of coping. They feel that upon their mother's passing, their pakikipagkapwa needed to be shown through their physical presence. However, when Ida's mother died, her Spanish residency status was still in process, so she could not be present. At the funeral, a mother herself by that time, Ida could not risk her own nor her daughter's status. Meanwhile, Dora had just come back to Spain after spending every day of her summer vacation taking care of her ailing mother in the Philippines. She no longer had resources nor time off from work to be present at the ritual of her mother's burial. When their grieving process is obstructed by factors like work and government policies, then having to forgo the visit in time of the crisis event, they need solace. They need to seek solace by justifying their absence that she will understand, or at least I took care of her. They feel the need to come to terms with their loss by finding consolation to overcome guilt because they were not able to say their final goodbyes in person. A pivotal point in the migrants' lives is that of the death of their mothers. Masqueral determines the grieving process as a turning point toward the change in perceptions of migrants toward their relationships. In my own research, it is as if the ties that connect them to the transnational family is anchored on their mothers. Prior to those deaths, they were focused on maintaining their transnational families, exchanging emotional remittances with them. But their mother's deaths initiated a transition turning away from their birthplaces and toward their present home and focusing on the ties that bind them there, like friends and your family. Their pakikipagkapwa extends to people who are not blood relations. Their friendships with fellow Filipinos were established through time spent together on their days off every Sunday. They started the day by attending mass together and then spent the whole day together eating, drinking, talking. Ida managed between her duties as worker and single mother with the help of her fellow Filipino migrants who helped raise her daughter. Kathy, who never married, nor had children, devoted herself to raising two wards for 17 years. She feels very close to them, whom she raised since they were born, and is still present in their lives today. The, Filip the community of Filipinos helped them cope as they longed for home and struggled to belong in Spain. Their relationships based on shared background and beliefs became their home away from home. From spending time together and talking about common experiences of adjusting to a different culture and their employers, they were bonded closer together. This is where I will die, all of them say. Their parents have passed away and siblings have their own families. Through Pakikipagkapwa, these relationships help them reconstitute a sense of self and a sense of home. Based on a common language, food, belief, and time spent together, they built bonds and a community. Pakikipagkapwa is the driving force behind their relationships. 
at the tail end of a life spent working to help family back home and reconstituting a sense of self in their new home, they face retirement years focused on local family, whether related to them by blood or because of important life experiences. The consequences of their pakikipagkapwa, however, reverberate to the present. Care work does not qualify them for substantial pensions sufficient for rising costs of living in Spain. To augment what they receive every month, the retirees have had to find sources of income for their daily expenses. Well beyond the COVID-19 pandemic, Filipino care workers may contribute to continue to leave their homes to find employment to contribute uh, to their families to build a better life back home, driven by pakikipagkapwa. I hope that social economic conditions in the Philippines and policies for migrant workers in host countries will improve to provide them with more nurturing and more humane environments. Thank you very much for listening. This is the end of my presentations. Uh, if any of you would like to find out some resources, uh, references that I used, uh, I can provide them and they are also posted here. Maraming salamat and I look forward to our conversation. Thank you.